Good morning, everyone, uh, both here and in KLT. Today, we're beginning a two-week sprint through Jeremiah 18 to 20. Uh, it's a relatively short segment of the book's 50-chapter argument, but it's one that made a deep impact on the Lord Jesus and his apostles. Uh, I reckon there are six sermons in these chapters, but I'm going to limit myself uh, to chapter 18, verses 1 to 12 this morning. Uh, let's pray for God's help as we begin. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to understand your word, to see you, and seeing you, to love you, and to live for you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, let's start with some context. Uh, since chapter 11, Jeremiah has been showing the people with devastating clarity that they have not just broken the covenant by worshipping idols, they have actually put the covenant beyond repair. Because they realized something. They realized that behind the Mosaic laws lay God's unconditional promise to Abraham. And so they figured out that they could basically get away with anything because God would have to forgive them. And that cynical exploitation of God's love was the thing that put them beyond forgiveness. Basically, their hearts were already dead and their bodies would soon follow. Jeremiah 11 to 17. Now there is, if you think about it, an obvious objection to this because there's no getting away from the fact that God did make a promise to Abraham and these are his chosen people, the elect of God. So Jeremiah's task in this chapter is to remove that last hope with a famous parable about divine repentance. Chapter 18, verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was spoiled in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, house of Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. If one moment I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, <clears throat> then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. <clears throat> and if one moment I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey me, then I will relent from the good I had intended to do for it. Now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says, look, I am shaping a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. But they will reply, it's no use. We will continue with our own plans. We will all follow the stubbornness of our evil hearts. <clears throat> well, Jeremiah's field trip to the potter's workshop was the experience that taught him not to think of Judah's failure to repent as a failure of God's plan. Right? When Jeremiah enters the workshop, he finds the potter mid-task, his whole attention on his work. Jeremiah's role is just to observe the shiny spinning clay on the wheel changing. It's like magic, isn't it? The way that pot changes shape under the potter's hands and somehow being spoiled. And we're not told what went wrong. Was the clay lumpy? Was there an error in the setup? We're not told. Jeremiah's field trip worksheet only has one question on it. That is, what will the potter do? Answer? Well, he smushes up the clay. He starts again and forms another pot. And the template for this pot, it says, is what seemed best to the potter, meaning what gave him pleasure, what suited his taste. It seems that the pot was spoiled simply means it wasn't what the potter had in mind. So there's the field trip, and after the field trip comes the lesson in verse 5 applied to Israel. The potter represents God, the control a master potter has over the clay represents God's control over Israel. Israel. Israel are like the raw materials out of which God realizes his artistic vision. Israel's a work in process. Israel's history is 
the process by which God unerringly shapes them into the reality that he had in mind from the very beginning. The two examples of this process that God's about to give Jeremiah reveal unexpected complications. Uh, verse, verses 7 and 9 examine two key moments that might lead the potter to start again. And I'm going to call them moment one and moment two, just to keep it clear. You notice in moment one how the focus shifts from Israel to any nation or kingdom. See that? The language of verse 7 is actually taken from Jeremiah's commission back in chapter 1, where God told Jeremiah, Today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow. In other words, moment one corresponds to Jeremiah's judgment preaching. But it leads to a new development. The potter cancels his plans to make a new pot because his current project, which seemed like it was going to go all pear-shaped, literally, uh, suddenly comes right again. Now, I know that skilled potters can often correct work that isn't turning out right, but in this case, it's a little bit weird. It seems to be like the clay that is doing the adjusting as the nation repents. But at the same time, God's word seems to be instrumental in the nation's action. Jeremiah's preaching has the power to put a nation back into shape. And if it does repent, then God will regret or relent from the evil that he was planning. God feels bad about what he was going to do. Obviously not out of self-blame. God's done nothing less than perfect. It's, it's that the very idea of destroying them is now a disturbing idea. God's change of mind is deeply morally engaged and wholehearted. It's moment one. Moment two is the perfect counterpoint. The action of building up and planting is also a language from Jeremiah's commission, but Jeremiah never actually made an unconditional promise like moment two describes. It's a hypothetical. If he did make such a promise to a nation who then did evil, they would get smushed up so the potter could use the clay for another pot. And that smushing isn't actually described, you'll notice in moment two, just God's regret. It's the same word used back in verse 8. Some Bibles say, change my mind, or something like that, instead of regret or relent. Uh, but I don't think that's necessary. The word regret in Jeremiah always describes changing course away from doing something terrible. And clearly it would have been terrible in this second moment to build up an evil nation. The horror of such a thing is something from which one rightly recoils. Well, that's the field trip and those are the lessons. What's Jeremiah supposed to learn? The word of God that Jeremiah has been given to speak is a word of irresistible power. It tears down nations. It builds up nations. But it's a word that may not always do what you would expect. And here's the thing. That doesn't mean the message has failed. It doesn't mean that God is not in perfect control. You know, Jeremiah had spent years preaching judgment, and he must have desperately hoped that this was going to lead to a moment one, right, where the potter would speak the rebellious clay back into shape again, and they would repent. But tragically, in the case of Israel, it was too late for moment one. Before Jeremiah even began to preach, Israel had already had their moment too when they cynically exploited God's promise to Abraham to make him into a great nation. Right? Moment two is a theologically challenging moment because God's word gets resisted. And we always thought it was meant to be irresistible. Isaiah famously asked, does the clay argue with the potter? And Jeremiah seems to flip the answer, doesn't he, from no to yes. This clay does resist the potter, but its resistance is futile because God's promised good is withdrawn in order that he can make the perfect pot. Right? God's sovereignty is undiminished. The outcome is never in doubt. Nothing, nothing at all can stop God from shaping a nation to his precise, perfect design that he always had in mind. 
Well, what does this mean for Jeremiah? Two things. First of all, God instructs Jeremiah in verse 11 to create basically a moment three. Right? Verse 11 starts out looking like moment one. There's a call to repent. But this time, calling Judah to repent is actually God's plan for ensuring their destruction. They respond to his disaster plan in verse 12 with an idolatry plan of their own. And their words about following the stubbornness of their hearts are actually a quotation from the Israelite in Deuteronomy whose cynical exploitation of the promise to Abraham puts them beyond forgiveness. Just how terrible it would be, how unthinkable to spare Israel, to spare Judah from destruction, is explained in the poem in verses 13 to 17, which I'll leave you to read at home. Um, That's the first thing that God's perfect plan means for Jeremiah. He needs to drive Judah to death by calling them to repent. Second thing it means for Jeremiah is personal pain and suffering. It starts with verbal attacks in verse 18. It ends in a plot to kill him in verse 23. Again, I commend the rest of the chapter to you. The people are going to express their hatred of God by shooting the messenger. Now, we've got no time, sadly, to look at the rest of this chapter, but what I want to do is just step back and offer two reflections on how these three moments, moments one, two, and then three, help us understand God's character. So, first of all, uh, I want to reflect on the fact that our rebellion cannot diminish God's sovereignty. If you think about moments one and three, they're simple enough. Right? Moment one is when God uses an announcement of disaster to fix a bad pot. Moment three is when God uses an announcement of disaster to destroy a bad pot. Either way, it's pretty simple. The result is exactly as God always planned. His sovereignty is absolute. Moment two, I think, is more difficult. God's promise was never designed to corrupt its recipients. And yet somehow Judah seems to be made of defective clay. God's promise appears not to have the power to change them, which is why he's now shaping the disaster of moment three. Feels a little bit like the irresistible force of God's word meets the immovable object of Israel's sin by just unmaking them, smushing up their lumpy clay. And how is that not a failure on some level of God's sovereignty? Well, there are two answers to this, and the first, I think, is simply to reassert the image of God as potter. Whatever things look like, we must know that God is in absolute control. Every act of rebellion will turn out to have been part of his perfect plan. The people's plans to follow their stubborn hearts align perfectly with God's plans to make the perfect pot. There's another answer, I think, in verse 7, a little clue to God's deep wisdom in allowing Israel the freedom to rebel. And the clue lies in the shift from Israel to nations and kingdoms. You know, God doesn't have a plan B. His last plan is his first plan, and it will include the nations. The nation that God brought into being through the Sinai covenant never became a kingdom of priests. They became an apostate people. God's word has been rebellion generating. Why? Because through Israel's destruction, God will fulfill his promise to Abraham by forming an Israel from many nations. Abraham's seed will not be the sole component of the final clay. That's basically what the second half of the book of Jeremiah is all about. As we all know, the tragedy and the glory of Israel's rejection of God reached its climax in their rejection of Jesus Christ. And when Paul agonizes over that tragedy in Romans 9, he never for one moment considers that God's promise or power might have failed. 
Instead, Paul explains that God bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. Why? To make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us whom he also called not only from the Jews but also from the Gentiles. Our rebellion, moment two, serves only to expose the deep wisdom and eternal power of God and his goodness. Second is really a reflection on our freedom and the fact that it cannot diminish God's freedom. Because what does this even say about the character of God? You know, for some theologians, God's responsiveness to us means that he's constantly playing catch-up, you know, changing his mind to accommodate to the free choices that we all make. But that's not what the Bible says, is it? Numbers 23, God is not a human being that he should change his mind. The trouble with Jeremiah 18 is that it seems to imply that God does change his mind. So theologians have often focused the application of this passage onto God as he relates to the world as opposed to God uh, in himself, which is what Numbers 23 describes. Aquinas said that God deferred his decree because of lesser causes, but there was no change in his disposition. And in every age, Christians have truly and rightly recognized that if God's uh, aseity were compromised, right, his self-existence, his complete independence of being, then he would stop being the transcendent God of the Bible. For Calvin, the idea that God might be responsive to our choices, might regret or relent or repent, is a mode of communication in which God, in order more effectually to pierce our hearts, clothes himself with our affections. And God does that to uh, what Calvin would call condescend, to go down together with humans. Well, what does that all mean? Does it mean that God isn't really regretful? Well, certainly the God of Jeremiah doesn't uh, regret or repent in the same way that sinful humans do. But I think it runs very hard against the grain of Scripture to deny any real connection between the regretful face God shows us and his own unchanging essence. Now, the theological challenge is to imagine how that might be the case without diminishing God's perfect nature, his immutability. And I think Jeremiah 18 helps us here as well. The illustration of the potter shows us that our actions and God's choice to respond to our actions actually become the means by which his eternal plan is carried out. Right? God's responsiveness makes our choices real choices. And as we'll see next week, the sufferings of Jeremiah display the intimacy with which God engages with his people. God's responses are marked by a deep regret that corresponds to the depth of the evil which his responsiveness prevents. But at the same time, don't forget moment two. Behind and in front of every divine response lies this ancient, gracious promise. It's unchanged and unchanging because it's an expression of God's unchangeable character. We might say that God walks with us in our freedom. And because he accompanies us as God in the use that we make of our freedom, his own freedom isn't damaged by our freedom. It's actually expressed by our freedom. It's an amazing dynamic. It's the dynamic, actually, of covenant. Of covenant. Here's how one theologian puts it. If God had willed to act alone or by means of non-autonomous agents or instruments, there would have been no need to institute a covenant. And the fulfillment of his will and creation need not have taken the form of a covenant history. The gracious God acts not only towards the creature, but also, however we explain it in detail, with the creature. His lordship is not tyranny. If it were, could it ever have attained its goal by God himself becoming a creature in his son? And in that way, by his free act of obedience and suffering, affecting the liberation of the creature. You see, the climax of the covenant in history 
is also the climax of the mystery of God's self-involvement in his creation. It's just stunning, this act of divine condescension by which the Son becomes flesh, and yet all the fullness of God dwelt in him. Jesus came into the world to do a work ordained by eternal decree, prophesied in Scripture, but to do that work as a human with real choices. It's a really interesting moment in Matthew 26 where Jesus makes it clear that he could have chosen to avoid death. But his free choice to submit to death sits together with its necessity from all eternity. Do you remember the words I'm talking about? Jesus says, Do you think I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jeremiah 18 gives us two profound truths about God to strengthen our trust and obedience. First is that we can rest in God's plan to make the perfect pot. We can know for sure that none of our gospel words are ever ineffectual. A call to repent is just as effective when it drives the hearers away from God as when it turns them back to God. It's all in God's perfect plan. We can rest in it. I find that really comforting. Secondly, the perfection of God's plan doesn't mean that he stands back aloof and unresponsive. He gives us the dignity and responsibility of having the freedom to make real choices. And he maintains his own eternal freedom by descending into the world as a human being and walking with us, making the choice to be obedient to death so that out of the smushed-up clay of our Lord's body, God could shape the perfect pot, the incorruptible human he always planned to make. Anything we choose to do is going to end up expressing God's freedom. But here's the thing. By giving us the spirit of Christ Jesus, our Father sets us free to make his choices with him. Isn't that amazing? To render service and praise to him, to become part of his heavenly people, his perfect pot. So as we move to the celebration of the Lord's Supper together, Let's just come before God and pray. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this day, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.